everyone. Happy New Year and welcome to Textile Talks. I am Leslie Levy, the Executive Director at the International Quilt Museum, and we are delighted to be with you today and to host this Textile Talk. Um, as I was looking at the comments from the chat, I think um, some of you who are saying, you know, welcome and hello from balmy Florida, warm this, hot this, must know that here in Nebraska, we are in the middle of a winter storm launch. So um, I can hear it. I doubt that you can hear it, but um, we have ice hitting our windows and our trees outside are freezing up. And as such, I'm doing this textile talk from home. And so because it's a live <laughs> program, uh, we're going to hope nothing goes amiss. Um, as I said, I am from the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska at the university. Um, we proudly steward the world's largest quilt collection. Uh, it spans five centuries and over 65 countries. Um, in fact, it's our mission and our passion to build a global collection and audience that celebrates the cultural and artistic significance of quilts. Um, if this is your passion too, um, quilts and textiles and art of all forms, then, and you haven't already become a member of the International Quilt Museum, we would love to have you join us. You can get more information at internationalquiltmuseum.org. Before we begin, I would like to recognize and thank um, our partner organizations who join us in providing textile talks each week. It is the Modern Quilt Guild, the Quilt Alliance, the San Jose Museum of Quilt and Textiles, SACWA, and of course, Service Design Association. Um, we are honored to bring you this free and inspiring programming um, with the help of our sponsors, whom you saw um, as we were waiting for everyone um, to enter and join us today. We couldn't do it without their generosity and the generosity of viewers and sponsors like yourself. So thank you very much. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to Lucy. Lucy works with Sakwa and she helps us every single week with the technology and the logistics and the details of textile talks. And Lucy, you are a rock star. And so thank you for everything that you do to help us. Um, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you. Um, also, just a couple of housekeeping um, rules before we begin. We have a great program and we want to get going on that. So Please use the chat um, to just say hello and visit amongst yourselves. Lucy will also use the chat function to drop in any <clears throat> um, links or other additional information. Um, otherwise, please use the Q&A for any questions that you will have for Mary and Michael today or myself. Um, and we will spend some time at the end of the program and answer those as well. If you prefer not to see notifications, please remember um, that you can disable those or close those. We also have live captioning. So if you, um, in order to make our textile talks more accessible to a broader audience, if you do not want to see those, you can also click and shut that down as well. So our guests today are Michael McCormick and Mary Fonz from Quilt Folk Magazine. I'm going to give you less than a thumbnail sketch, um, an introduction to Michael and Mary, um, mostly because their histories and their stories and their experiences um, will come out as we talk today. And so I don't want to spoil anything. So um, Michael McCormick um, is not a quilter. Uh, like myself, not a quilter, but an appreciator. And um, Michael was a former professional baseball player with the Tampa Bay Rays. He was drafted right out of high school, um, played pro ball for five years. And at first glance, it seems unlikely that a professional ball player um, would be the owner of an incredible publication. But like many of us, right, we have those chance encounters and those work experiences that start us on a path and a journey that we never knew we were going to take. But thank God we do, because something wonderful always happens. And Michael will tell you a little bit about that as we visit today. Um, I will say he is a self-described, quote unquote, big dreamer. And I hope that you can appreciate and understand what that means um, by the end of today's program. 
Also with us is Mary Fawns. Mary, as many of you know, um, you've been in her lectures, you've joined her on one of her online forums, whether it's YouTube, Twitch. Um, she's a writer, editor, live streamer. Um, her wonderful program, Quilt Nerd, airs weekly on Twitch. You can also see it on YouTube. Um, Mary is all things quilts, um, whether that be a researcher, a lecturer, a quilter, um, an appreciator. So welcome, Mary Fonz. Um, my good Mary, Thank it's you. wonderful to have you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being a part of this program. Um, Michael, I'm going to throw the first question out to you. Um, not really to use a baseball analogy, but I kind of did. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> how did quilt folk start? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, it's great to be here. So thank you. And uh, great to be here with Mary as well. So looking forward to the conversation. Um, Cool folk really started uh, from an observation. Um, I had been part of the quilting community for a number of years at that point in different capacities, and I was meeting a lot of quilters. And as you stated, I wasn't a quilter myself, but the observation that I made at the time was just that quilters were people, meaning mm -hmm. they had lives and careers and husbands and wives and children, and they had struggles and triumphs and all the things that is wrapped up into that human experience mm -hmm. and that I was as I was talking to them deeper you know we made we came together through the quilting industry but really I was becoming interested in them as people and I found inspiration in their stories and particularly how quilting was sort of woven into their human you know their, their personal stories so the observation was that and it was really um We'll get to that in a second. Um, <laughs> the, the observation was really just that um, I wanted other people to hear the stories I was hearing and find inspiration in that. And I think everything we've done with Quilt Folk up until this point has sort of been trying to fulfill that concept of how do we tell these stories in a way that are beautiful, mm -hmm. inspirational, um, that kind of, uh, that are unexpected, I guess, surprising yeah. sometimes to people. And, you know, past that, it's, as I said, it's just been a, an attempt to fulfill that through our work. Um, and we've been doing it now for, you know, six plus years and, and 25 issues. I could show the, the pictures from the magazine and not the fridge pic at first. I, right. <laughs> this is like, a, we're going, I mean, off the cuff, I've got a lot of photos for people today, but Yep. There's but a, now, yeah, you many, have, now you have to explain. Well, now I have to explain. Your <laughs> and I, I well, knew Mike wants to talk about the fridge, so I, I jumped the gun a little bit, but yeah, beautiful okay. picture. Well, yeah, we well, th this is sort of interesting. The, the conversation today partially mm -hmm. revolves around this discussion of risk, which I really enjoy. Yeah. I mean, there's, <clears throat> when you think about risk, intuition, and mm -hmm. story, in a lot of ways that encapsulates, I think, our creative lives. Um, maybe even our lives just in general, because you have uh, risk, which is really just kind of how you process decisions. Sure. And then and you have intuition, which is sort of one of the big driving forces behind mm -hmm. how you make those decisions. And then you have story, which is kind of what you tell yourself and other people about why you made that choice. And so what's funny with entrepreneurship in my story a little bit is people will say, well, wasn't it kind of risky to start a different kind of quilting magazine yeah. Um, you know, you go from this career to that without any experience. And I always, I mean, I understand why there's this lore around entrepreneurial risk, but the reality is a lot of people like myself, when we started, it's not like there was a, a great alternative at that time to starting your own business. I mean, I, this picture was when I was a single guy, you know, I had tea, hot sauce, beer, and normally mm -hmm. there'd be maybe some, uh, like, you know, tortillas and cheese in the fridge or something. I mean, that, you know, I, ha I was, I was starting from relatively nothing after my baseball career. And I had, I had gone through a multitude of, of jobs and things. And so I guess my point to that is that sometimes when you're first starting things, that's when things are the least quote unquote risky, because you you just have this idea, you have this vision and uh, you don't get in your own way, you know, about mm -hmm. trying to go pursue that thing. And so I just threw this up there because, you know, as we talk about risk, it's just funny to say at that time, um, as I said, I was single, 
you know, not a lot of bills, not a lot of other things going on. So we could do that. Now, fast forward, you know, it's six years and it's been amazing how my life has changed. I've got two beautiful daughters, a lovely wife, um, and we've got our third, third child on the way here in about three weeks. And so, you know, risk changes over time, um, things change over time, but that was kind of, that's, that was the, the beginning of the mm -hmm. story of Quill Folk. I love it. Can you imagine right now doing anything else with your life? I mean, yeah, I, I can actually, but, but it's, um, but I love what I do and I love the people that I do it with. And for me, it, it's not, um, what I like about Quilt Folk is it, you're working with a number of different people from all walks of life on all kinds of projects all the time. You know, it's not sure. like we only do one thing. And as I said, you know, we're, we're looking at quilts, but we're also doing other things. And it's just really a versatile, um, you know, experience, I guess you could say. And so I love mm -hmm. it. Um, of course, I have other interests as, as quilters do, right? I mean, quilters, they make a lot of quilts, but they have other interests that help inform their creative decisions. And I would say that's true with quilt folk, you know, like um, even my experience as a baseball player, I hadn't put this connection before, but, you know, I was traveling from age 18. I was traveling state by state. I was playing 180 something games a year, traveling around the country to different small towns and meeting teammates that were from all across the United States from different, you know, economic backgrounds, social backgrounds. We were you know, playing with a lot of people from other countries. And so through that whole journey, it's, it's kind of the same. You're trying to understand the, yeah. uh, the nature of people and interactions and what makes them tick. And I feel like I'm still kind of doing that. And hopefully I'm kind of doing that for the rest of my life, you know. Good. Well, tell me how, um, <clears throat> I love the story about you in the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. Will you share that with us? Sure. And, and then we'll go on to how you and Mary met. Yeah. Yeah. The, the coffee sh shop story was um, with a former mentor and kind of a business partner who uh, went on to start a company called Stella Lighting. Um, we were, we were working in led lighting for, for, for education, you know, school systems. Mm -hmm. And we were playing with a prototype lamp that we had developed and, uh, he had primarily developed and we were sitting in a Starbucks playing with this prototype and a woman came up to us and said, oh my gosh, I'm a, I'm a seamstress and, um, I love this light. You know, what is it? Where can I get it? And we were like, whoa, that was a really strong you know kind of visceral reaction to our light and also what is a seamstress like what is this all about and so we kind of went through this journey of from from that to then it became quilting and we ended up hitting the road and doing kind of a, a sales trip in the state of Oregon hitting every quilt shop independently owned quilt shop along the way and people loved our light it just really took off and went crazy and so that was my introduction to the quilting world and from there you know I was going to quilt markets and festivals and trade shows and meeting you know, meeting interesting people. So that's kind of how we got our start, just a complete fluke chance interaction with, uh, you know, with the seamstress in a Starbucks. Love it. You never know how a conversation is yep. going to change your life. Yeah, so that's sort of, you... I was just going to say like that, yeah. um, I think just trying to constantly be observant and, and mm -hmm. noticing things like that's, uh, I think it's important, you know, for artists do that all the time. People listening to this, you know, you, you will, you will for sure relate to that. You're, you're walking down the street, you see something interesting, could be in nature, could be something you read in a book or something, and it strikes you a certain way. And then it sends you down a whole creative path. And in some ways, that's what we wanted Quill Folk to be. You know, that's why you'll see in the pages, you'll see the food that, that we, that we find in the States that we're at. You'll see the landscapes, the animals, the all kinds of things. Part of that is to try to cultivate this idea that you really don't know where inspiration mm -hmm. is going to come from all the time. You're just trying to keep like an open mind and uh -huh. let all of that data flow in and then ultimately, you know, see how it moves you. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you because our Q&A is yeah. getting some, some movement um, as is in our chat. And they want to know what the name of the light was 
that you were taking to festivals and quilt shows. So if you could say that again. Yeah, that was called the uh, Stella Lighting, StellaLighting.com. And uh, it was really cool at the time. It was a kind of a breakthrough piece of technology and you know, it still is, they continue to innovate, but it's a great product. All right, thank you. So tell us how you and Mary met. Well, Mary and I met because for issue two, we, we uh, well, I should back up. Issue one, we, we covered the home state of, my home state of Oregon, which, mm -hmm. you know, worked out well. It was in our backyard. It, for issue two, um, we went to Iowa in part because I had heard that Iowa had more quilt shops like per capita than anywhere in the, in the country. And I thought, well, this would be a really great place to go. And so we went to Iowa um, and by kind of chance got connected with Marianne Fons, um, which, you know, looking back, it's kind of funny how that worked because we were just this no name organization, you know, cold calling people. And, but Marianne was very gracious. She, she really opened up her time and her connections as well and really helped us formulate that issue. But through that relationship, you know, at the time, I think, Mary, you were a student. Um, and she said, hey, I've, I've, you know, my daughter's a writer. You should really talk to her. And I think it took us a couple issues, but Mary came on finally as a writer in issue four. And, um, you know, just really enjoyed our conversations together. Mary, we, we worked together very well, have, you know, ever since that day in various capacities. But just, it was immediate that she had a tremendous authentic passion for quilts and quilters and was a great writer and so it was a natural sort of friendship uh and a working relationship that has just kind of you know grown since that time and uh, I guess would have been 20 something issues ago now I love it so Mary talk to us and tell us <clears throat> from your perspective and being a part of the creation and the creative director and and um, helping with that, what makes Quilt Folk Magazine different from other publications? Why, why, are, why, are, you, why are you involved? Well, um, so I describe Mike as, you know, my brother from, from another mother, honestly, like, I don't know, there's, uh, I have great respect for Mike for what he did for the risk he took in making a magazine that was so totally different from anything that it come before. And I, I like taking risks, even if I don't think they're risks at the time, I just kind of like, like swerving, you know, like from, yeah. from the mainstream. And, and so when I first saw Cool Folk, I remember my friend Heather showed me the first issue and I was like, it's great. It'll never work. It'll, it'll never work. Not without us. Because, you know, I had grown up, you know, under this very uh, tight, uh, I mean, I loved Fonz and Porter. I loved my time there. I loved working with my mom, but, you know, somewhat oppressive just in terms of the quilts that I made for my whole quilt life until I left um, to go to grad school uh, in 2016. Every quilt I ever made was bound for publication. It was going to be used on the TV show or it was going to be used in the magazine. And so I was creative within limits. And sometimes Mike and I talk about how, how good that can be to have uh, constraints and work within that, um, uh, that creativity, the, the patchwork and pros block of the month program that I'm involved with um, that's almost over now uh, with Quilt Folk has been a huge success. And, and that's, uh, uh, you know, putting limits and constraints on a, on a certain project so that people can be creative within that anyway. But all my quilts and the things that I did were were limited to some extent because I couldn't make a, a wild pictorial quilt, you know, that I would love to make because you can't teach it on TV, right? So anyway, so this was the world that I grew up in and I was doing quilty before I went to grad school. And, um, and then, and then cool folk comes along and I'm like, you know, my first reaction was like, it's great. I don't know. Like, how are they going to survive without ads? How are they going to do this? And then I started to understand it. And I started to see that quilt folk was doing what I desperately wanted to happen in the quilt world, which is, and I hope it doesn't sound too lofty, but you know, quilt folk gives dignity to quilt makers, because like Mike was saying, you know, we're looking at the whole person, we're looking at the whole quilter. Quilters are not just people who make quilts, you know, we're, we're mothers and daughters, and we have other interests, and we're, you know, deep people, you know, educated people, not educated people, art quilters, traditional quilters, 
And so what Quilt Bulb was doing and what I was starting to do with quilt history, I don't make many quilts these days, I'm just so steeped in the culture and, and history of it all, um, was to get this total picture of the people and the work that they make uh, in, in this quilt space. And I realized, I was like, what was I thinking? And so when Mike asked me if I wanted to write for Tennessee, I was like, absolutely. And then I crawled my way up the corporate ladder and <laughs> became mm -hmm. associate editor and then editor. And, and now I'm doing production projects for, for Quilt Folk, yeah. So when you think about Quilt Folk, um, you know, the beauty of it, right? What makes Quilt Folk unique is you are really looking at people at the quilters. You chose, how, how is it that you decided that your journey would be to look at states and to go from states? Was it, was it because you started in Iowa because they had a lot of quilt shops or was there a thought process behind, um, let's approach this from a state by state? Yeah. This is one of those cases, you know, I've, I've said this quote in the past, I love it. It's a Steve mm -hmm. Jobs quote that he talked about when he was giving his commencement speech at Stanford, but he said, you can only connect to the dots looking backwards. You can't always connect them looking forwards. That sometimes you have to trust in, and now I'm paraphrasing, trust in something, your gut, your intuition, something sure. about these decisions. And the reality is I could have never forecast at the time we started that the state-by-state -state model would be something that was as powerful mm -hmm. as it was. Um, there were two um, there were two reasons why we did that. One was logistical reason. I mean, the cost yeah. of because we one of the things we do that's different is you send a whole team of people on the road. I mean, every photo that yeah. we have is original. So we've got now, I think, over a couple hundred thousand original images in our archive. And that costs a lot of money, especially when you're a startup. And so you try to find a way. I mean, we used to just fly everyone in one big car you know, get a big Airbnb or whatever it is, rent a place and just spend 10 days in a state. Well, you can't do right. that if you're trying to reach, you know, the whole country. And so I think that that's uh, one reason. And then I think so the second part of it probably is this intuitive sense that, um, that there were going to be regional differences and that that was going to provide some flavor and some spice to every issue that was different okay. so that it didn't become the same thing. But you know, the first quote we ever had in a Quilt Folk magazine was a James Joyce quote that talked about, uh, in the particular lies the universal. And for me, that was always meant that you could go to any town in America and explore what made it interesting and cool and, you know, and distinct. But at the same time, there was some kernel of truth that could resonate and ripple through you know, the rest of the states and maybe the world. So it was just one of those things you fell into to some degree. And then as soon as you observe that there's something magical there, then the key is to do more of that thing. So I remember um, the simplest, the simplest advice for success that is also the most difficult to follow, which is if something's working, do more of it. And if it's not, do less of it. And for some reason, okay. That is really hard to do. You you mm -hmm. because you start away, you're having success. So let's say with the state by state model, and then you say, well, now we have increased budgets or we have things. So why don't we, you know, do something different? And I'm so happy that the team that we chose not to do that, we continue to do it because it's one of the hallmarks of the magazine now. And so and in 2021, when, uh, yeah. Sorry. I think go ahead and finish what you were going to say, Mary, and then I'll ask a question that's popped up in the chat a couple of times. Sure. Um, it is scary to, you know, we're talking about risk and, and intuition and, and all of that. And, and Mike, something you said about, you know, do more of the thing that's working. What's really scary is when something is working, but you, yeah. you know, you feel like, like when I, I mean, editing the magazine, I love, I've got magazines in my blood, man. I mean, I just, I made magazines when I was like six years old. I love it so much. And I loved making quilt folk and I loved the experiences. And if anybody's out there from Louisiana, there are regional differences, uh, you know, but most people are just, most quilters are just amazing. But I gotta tell you the Louisiana quilters, the nicest people, the most, the kindest people I've ever met. Just a shout out to Louisiana as I'm thinking back on my time as editor, but, but things were working and I, and I did love making the magazine, but there were other things that I wanted mm -hmm. to do and other things yeah. I wanted to do with folk. And so that's really scary when you're like, you know what, this is safe, this is comfortable, yeah. but I had, and I know that I could go to Mike with that that sentiment and he totally gets it. So yeah, that's yeah. really good. 
Yeah, I mean, well, just briefly, that kind of gets into the intuition part of things, which I think we're mm -hmm. going to talk about later. But, um, you know, there's when something's working, it's not working. That's not always just, you know, a binary black and white choice. They, they work on different levels. You have parts of you that are mm -hmm. um, like you have to run a business, as an example, and that has to work. But you right. also want to feel fulfilled as an artist and as a creator. And that also has to work if you're going to have long term. Um, happiness and so I think in the case of what you're saying is like there are times when you feel as if yes this is functionally working it is in that mm -hmm. case paying the bills it is right. doing what it needs to do but it's not it's not touching me in that part of my soul that's really calling out and people have a like I think people have a different relationship with that part of them some people are highly tuned into when they're feeling mm -hmm. some inner angst in that way particularly as from a creative standpoint um, and I think it's something you can cultivate as well. But I think in that case, that's kind of what you're describing. It just wasn't, it was good, but it wasn't the right, it wasn't at the right, it was, it was not right for right then, you know, sure. it was something well, else. Exactly. Yeah. So a couple questions. <clears throat> when you are done covering the States, will you go international? Yeah, international or intergalactic, depending on how long it takes us to get there. I think, <laughs> um, you know, we could talk about quilts in space later. But um, the the thing, the hardest part about quilt folk is you could t you could do every state twenty times. Yes. yes. And right. so I don't think we're ever going to run out of that. It'll be an interesting choice. That I'm going to give uh -huh. a shout out to uh, our editor in chief, uh, Brianna Briggs, who that that uh, creative problem will now fall on her shoulders as she does all the planning for issues and does an incredible job with the work that she does. And so I'm going to leave that to for her to solve, I think. Right. So um, one, a couple questions, and then we're going to go on. And Mary, you have to show us more pictures. I know that you have pictures <laughs> and um, we want to see them because you always so have- sorry. You always have a plethora of fabulous images. Um, so you show us pictures while Mike and I, my Michael and I visit for a couple minutes. Um, talk to us and, and explain to us how um, you have this kind of great quote. And it it is it was before you started the magazine and you said, I've just found out that if you research things too much, you end up finding a reason not to do them. Yeah. If I really knew how hard it was to produce a quarterly magazine, or if I really knew how incredible all those other publications were, it would have sort of scared me away from taking those first steps. Um, I love that quote because it's honest. Mm -hmm. And um, I also feel like it talks to us about, about how other artists, quilt makers, creators approach their own businesses. I mean, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it's, I think everybody's different in this capacity. You have to know who you are mm -hmm. as a creator. And yeah. You know, it's as an example, like going into today's to today's conversation as as an yeah. example. Some people perform best when they have things really written out, and they're ultra prepared, and their notes are all typed up, and and they feel great doing that. For yeah. me, that that's never really worked. I try to go in right. like very open, and I have an idea of things we're going to talk about, but I just know myself well enough to know I, I cannot be over prepared, right. and that's how I kind of perform the best. And I think it's similar that way with myself and say knowing what other magazines are doing um mm -hmm. or what somebody's doing creatively on social i mean there's a fine line between being inspired by that um and also sometimes having it cloud your own vision and i, I don't have a clear answer as to you know how, like what i would tell somebody to do only that it sh that you should at least be aware of it that if right. you're spending a lot of time on instagram and you're seeing what other people are doing particularly when you're starting out, um, I think it can, I think it can overwhelm people mm -hmm. and it can intimidate you because you, you think mm -hmm. that, well, I had this idea for this, but, and they're, they're doing something similar and it's really great. And I'm not going to be that great. And so you end up 
right. kind of talking yourself out of it if you're prone to that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, which which I am. I I am prone to overthinking, overanalyzing, and so mm -hmm. for me, just personally, trying to have kind of a clean slate and just be really clear on the original thought or vision that you have sure. really works. And I will just put a caveat in there though, that there are times that when you're in the sort of daily minutia of creating and those things, you can't just, I can't just turn my phone off and you know be completely unaware of what's going on in my business. But for creative, it's just, it's one of those things you have to know yourself and what inspires you or what can also right. discourage you. Thank you. Yeah, that's so true. And it's so nice to hear somebody who is incredibly successful say that out loud. Um, Mary, we haven't seen any photos, any change of photos. And I know that you have amazing photos. So I don't okay. know if if we're having technical, you know, that's the problem when you're live. Right? That is so strange. Let me, uh, let me just, oh, here. I, okay. I think. Yeah. Um, I can say, by the way, that's the first trade show we ever, and a funny story about that. We I showed have been, up I've to been pictures this whole time. Wow. Okay. We yeah. we yeah. uh we didn't have the magazine. The first trade show. We we yeah. it was supposed to ship. It got there the last day, and I was in such a panic because we had all these people and nothing to show. It was like the last day of the show. It it came into the back of the mm -hmm. of the trade show. They delivered it, and it was so heavy and so big, and it cost like seven thousand dollars to transport the the magazines from one part of the room to the next part of the room and we couldn't even sell them or do anything with them because the show was basically over and so oh, uh, that no. was a rookie entrepreneurial mistake right there but it did end up working out so so one of the things that makes quilt folk so beautiful and unique is the amazing photography yeah so um and mary is showing mary we're seeing some of your photos now I had so many. I'll go through all, all of them that I showed before. It said I was sharing, but I guess not. So okay. I will, um, will photobomb you now. Again, we're live, right? It happens. Yeah, it's a right, human exactly. process. Um, exactly. How do you decide who your photographer is, Michael? I mean, quilt photography is hard. It's hard to get the details, whether regardless of what type of quilt art you're making, it's hard. It is. <laughs> and what you're seeing really is actually, it's not just the photography. I mean, it's actually, you've got to have, um, it, of course, the, the photographs, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but also our designer, Janelle, who, who kind of has you know created these layouts and allowed those photos to shine. You've got your editor, your editing team that's got to pick the right photos, you know, that they have to tell a story. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into storytelling with visuals, but I would just say, um, I would say we just have a really amazing team. I mean, that's the short answer. The, 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 the fun thing about working with the team is if you gave me a camera and you know a hundred years to go take pictures, I would not be able to deliver these things. Um, but I can work with people who can. And when all of those people get together, they can produce something really great. So the photographers themselves, we've been very fortunate uh, really from day one. Actually, Brianna, who I mentioned is our, our editor-in-chief now, she started as a freelance photographer for issue one, filling in. And uh, I would say that the, the one common thread, because they all have different styles of shooting, all things, but you have to have an eye, meaning there has to be something um, that moves you or is, you know, I, I use the word remarkable, something worthy of making remark about in a photograph that either helps move the story along or give you some kind of keen insight or something about that. And it just so happens that our photographers, Azure, Melanie, and everybody before, they just have a great sense of storytelling and, and they're so keen on picking up those details that you can only get when you're in person and you're you know, in someone's space. Um, and I'll say that's the other thing. I have this rule about um, interviewing somebody, which we're not gonna be able to test this today, but my my sort of rule is that the magic of an interview always comes in the third hour of talking with somebody because that's when everyone really gets comfortable and you know what questions to ask. It's very similar with photography. I mean, most of the time we're spending multiple hours at a location, meaning, you know, by hour two or three of, and they're, and the photographers are listening to the interviews and they're part of this process. They're thinking along with the writer 
and they're able to pick out those parts of the story that are really um, right. interesting. Would you agree, Mary? I mean, this is you. You did this as the editor in chief. You. This was your your role, picking photos. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And and with patterns and and the different things we've done, it's like you know the the photographers. One of the things that's unique about quilt folk and and was a risk, right, to make the model uh, as you know designed as it was, is you know you're with these people for days and days i mean we we've tried different things and 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 uh the process is a little different now uh but you know you're in the car with with a photographer you're in, you're in a car with the writers you know you're traveling together and some of the best times of my life have been in cars you know driving through utah almost running out of gas that was not so great you know but like being together everybody biting their nails together you know and so and so when you're with people that closely and you're working mm -hmm. that closely i mean Azri and i who are we're very good friends uh, at this point melanie and i are so so fond of each other as well i mean you really have a shorthand and you can start to just kind of look at each other and and know that that you know let's get that or or doing style shots or 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 whatever it is um it's a pleasure to be able to work like that in an ensemble um and it's it i don't know i mean i've been on other magazines that you know had style shots and things and you go scouting for a place to shoot quilts but but on the road when you're thinking quickly um if you're a creative person that's that's your element that's what you love you know like find me a a, a a brick wall with ivy growing on it great you know let's put the the purple quilt on it you know that kind of thing so so yeah we've gotten extremely lucky with so many everybody we've worked with you know talented okay. and passionate about quilts yeah okay. i could give a little practical thing about photography though so we were talking about like so intuition and trying to you know figure out when mm -hmm. some of you're doing is right versus pivoting and whatnot when we first started i I was pretty adamant that we weren't going to have any styled quilt photos or any photos of even people <laughs> that everything was going to be completely however we found it. Um, so if you actually go back to the first few issues of Quilt Folk, you'll see kind of more of that style. And I think one of the things that Mary and I, you know, early on talked about when she came on was you, you want that, but also like the quilts are, it's important to show them in a way that people can see them just right. as an example. Right. And um, so you do make little changes to that. You know, here I was really adamant that it was gonna be this way. And now, you know, we've evolved that. And that those kind of decisions in the creative process, people will for sure, um, uh, you know, relate yeah. to. So <clears throat> we're, I'm gonna pivot you all. We talked about pivoting, not being afraid to pivot when something doesn't work or, or to try new things. <clears throat> you know, we, we have 20 minutes left. Wow. Um, and so I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna move us along. I wish we had three hours, Michael. We could get into the weeds. <clears throat> um, there was a question asked about whether or not um, any of the individuals in Quilt Folk have been showcased, artists that have been, you know, quilt makers that have been yeah. showcased in magazine have any of them exhibited in a national museum <clears throat> or how do you choose the people that you're going to feature in okay. your magazines um i was pretty sure at the beginning that we wanted to have a pretty good snapshot of america in the magazine and of quilters so they weren't um the example i use all the time is in issue four tennessee you know, I had a chance to ask Dolly Parton just a few questions about her song Code of Many Colors and about quilting and those things. And it was kind of an amazing experience. It was brief, but one that I really enjoyed. And we put it in the magazine. Um, but directly after that was a story on Minnie Lee Deacons, which uh, Minnie was at the time, I think, 94 years old and, um, you know, lives in a small town, you know, outside of Nashville and has been making quilts for her county fair for for the better part of her life and has just an incredible story. And nobody's heard of her. She's not exhibiting on a national stage, but her story is compelling nonetheless. And so those two stories live side by side in Quilt Folk. And I think it's important because the one thing I will say, and I'll say this to anyone who was listening to, I, I was surprised a lot of times when you approach people about being in the magazine, they will say, well, I, I don't think I'm worthy of being in a magazine. Or I don't think my, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna, care about my story. And my response is like, everybody has an interesting story. 
And you just have to dig and figure out even within yourself, you know, like what those kernels of intrigue are. And so a lot of our job, I think, as people who interview people or whatnot is to try to help people change the story that they tell themselves about themselves. You know, like there's probably nothing more important in life than the story you tell yourself about yourself, because that will dictate what kinds of choices you're going to make, all kinds of things. And so with Quilt Folk, it's like, I don't know, it'd be incongruent with our philosophy if we only showed people who had achieved a certain level of success, say, with quilting. But those people are also equally fascinating. So it's to me, it's a balance. Right. And we honestly try not to think about things like this style versus that style or this. It, it's sort of, yeah. we try not to think about it. You know, and and I mean, we talked at the beginning about you know the whole quilter seeing the person, not just the person who you know is making mm -hmm. charity quilts for guild. And it's amazing that's well how we got to her, right? But um, it's it's true about the whole quilting community as well, the nationwide community and beyond. I mean, there are the superstar uh, you know winners that we we go and, and meet these people, a lot of them. But like Mike said, you know, there are people whose names you'll never know. Um, and some of them we get to feature in Quilt Folk so that you do meet them, if you will. But, you know, just like there are, I mean, one of the reasons I love Quilt so much is it's a democratic art. Anyone can do it, right. anyone. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to speak the language, you know? You know, you know it's, it's the, uh, the language of quilts is universal, you could say. And so it's a democratic art. And that means, you know, rich, poor, black, white, you know, anybody can do it. And so with Quill Folk, yeah. it's so important. Brianna does such a brilliant job too. And, and, and from the start, it's it's the whole nation of quilt makers that are featured in Quill Folk, not just superstars and not just, uh, you know, it's just folks and everybody else too. Exactly. I would just well, say, can I, can I just uh, for quickly, because I know we're talking, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking with artists and the, the question is like, what does this have to do with your own practice to a certain degree? And I would just say like, you know, you just never know where your inspiration is going to come from. And I think people know this, like, like I said, you can be, um, you can be talking to somebody at the, you know, at the salon or at the grocery store, anywhere that could say something that could totally change the trajectory of your life. And mm -hmm. if you're only allowing yourself to, to take in that information within a small, uh, you know, subsection of, or cohort of, of, people or places and things like it's it's not that it's bad it's just um, you're gonna miss some stuff you know right so two things um because we time is time is marching quickly um tell us tell us michael about fiber art now not everyone on our call today are traditional or modern quilters we have an audience of all sorts of artists um, in different genres. And um, <clears throat> I love um, your connection. Um, and I, I want people to know that you are also connected to fiber art now. So can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Yeah, so we um, began publishing and purchased fiber art now last March. And, um, and, and you know, I don't I don't know how much to go into, but you know, for in large part in some conversations, Leslie, that you and I even had about this this opportunity and things that came up. And uh, long story short, it was a magazine that was published for ten years and mm -hmm. just did an amazing, amazing job. And um, so there was an opportunity to start publishing that. And we have um, and a great team that's been there for a long time. We're now in our going on our first year of full kind of of uh, my publishing it. And you know we grew the page count, we uh, improved the paper, and uh, reduced the ads significantly. And we're just trying to produce the best thing that we possibly can. It's the same thing as Quilt. Like you just, you know, with the magazines or with anything, I I want us mm -hmm. to live and die by the uh, support of our readers. In the end, that's what matters. We're trying to make things that are interesting and compelling. And uh, and with Fiber Art now, it really is a beautiful publication, one that I'm really proud yeah. of everything that's being done there. And it is gorgeous. To, to the Fiber Art Now <laughs> magazine, I mean, some people might have thought that was, you know, um, uh, an unusual choice, or but we've been featuring art quilters and surface designers mm -hmm. and quilt from the start. I mean, Nancy Crasco, uh, I had a picture of her, you know, from the Iowa issue. Mm -hmm. There's just 
th throughout. So there's this very tight relationship between all of that. And I think it's, it's so fabulous. It looks so beautiful. Yeah. And if you think something's interesting, you know, mm -hmm. um, chances are somebody else will also find it interesting. And so that's like with this, I, I just think it's really neat content. I mean, what people are producing mm -hmm. is fascinating. And it turns out that a lot of people agree and it's just been good fun, you know? I think that <clears throat> the visuals in both magazines are so inspiring. And I'm, I, am, I am not a maker. I do not have those talents. Um, and I find, for me, it is so easy to get seduced into reading and looking and spending time in both magazines because they are so beautiful. The images, the colors, the creativity, the design. Um, <clears throat> I just think it's fantastic. I just love it. And I'm so okay. glad that you are a part of that. Tell us um, <clears throat> what's on the horizon. Well, um, I have a, an, an unboxing that we, can, we can't see, yeah, we, I think Lucy said it was maybe the first one ever on a textile talk. We, uh, we're, I've been working on a project um, with my- <laughs> Hey, Mary, so Mary, real quick, yeah. before you start, let's yeah. take, take your uh, screen share off so we can see you bigger. Oh, yeah, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Man, this photo thing has been whew, a lot of pressure, but ho hopefully you enjoyed those, those photos. Um, so we've been working on something for the past few months. Um, uh, I've been, yeah, really, I, it's very exciting. We're going to unveil it, probably launch it in, in next month. That's we're on target for that. Um, and we can't say too much about it. You have to stay tuned, but this unboxing that I have to do, there's a quilt that arrived. Um, it has to do with the project that we're doing and I haven't opened it yet. It's, it came back from the long armor. Um, Quilt Folk is working on this quilt. We send it to the long armor and I'm gonna unbox it right here and show it to you. Okay. I can't believe I've waited to open it, but I thought it would be really fun. So here we go. Okay. And I made sure I had lots of room. So I've, yeah, it's hard not to tell you more, but you'll see in time. This so is everybody put your view on speaker so you can see Mary in full. This is a red and green applique top from, it's the 19th century. Um, and uh, it's now, this quilt, oh my God. Mike, are you ready? Ah! Oh man, woo! Oh, oh boy. Wow. Oh, yeah. oh, it's so great. Look, she did such a wonderful job. Wow, oh, that's gorgeous. Look at that, incredible. Wow, look wow. at that quilting. Yeah. Stephanie Patterson in Texas did this and I get to, I'm gonna turn the binding myself, it's like, my favorite thing to do. I hate putting binding on, but I love to turn it. So I'm going to turn the binding myself uh, and I will not be snacking while I do it. Not with this one, um, but this is, uh, it's an almond. I think it's flowering almond is the pattern. And what I can do is the best thing I could do is probably put it up here so people can see it. Um, there are, there are some light marks on it, but I mean, it is absolutely it's a masterpiece. And I mean, she just look at what she did. It's so great. Hey, Mary, so can Mary, I, uh, we don't, yeah. I'm sorry, Michael, Mary, we don't know who made it. Is that correct? No, we just, no. okay. We yeah, do not we know, know the, the maker. Yeah, exactly. So I can yeah. segue this into something maybe for, so we can't talk about the project, although it's coming, but I will say that if you follow Quilt Folk or you don't, we're always trying new things. We're always doing new things and some of them work and some of them don't. But at this point, it's kind of built into our, our DNA or like I said earlier, the story we say about ourselves is that we try things. And when you do that, if it doesn't work mm -hmm. out, you're not necessarily surprised because you said, well, that's part mm -hmm. of our, it's part of what we do, right? Well, we do a lot of things at Quilt Folk that aren't magazine related. And um, a lot of that is just, again, picking up on these observations uh, that you find along the way. And Mary and I had an observation about some of these quilts and some of these quilt tops that exist. And so we've kind of put this program together of something we're gonna try to do with those. And it feels right. It feels really good and it's exciting and we're excited by it. So. Um, 
you know, that's kind of the barometer, I guess you would say that we use when trying to approach new projects. Are, are we, do we feel like this is right? Does it feel good? Are we excited about it? Is the rest of the team? And if it is, we'll usually give it a shot and then see what happens. So that kind of dovetails with a question. Somebody had asked about how is it that you got started doing workshops or that you got started, um, you know, you now have a shop with various products. Um, how is it that that business model has come into the publication of your magazines? Well, we never thought of ourselves as a magazine company, really. And that's okay. number one. So we were never limited saying, well, we do magazines and that's all that we do. It was always like, no, we're telling stories and having a good time and trying to make people feel great and all these things. So when you have that view and that lens and then you're going through life and the team's going through all of our work, things come up. And, um, and that was the way it was with workshops. I mean, that started as... I have a very good friend, Kanet, who owns a quilt shop called Something to Crow Brow here in Springfield, Oregon. And we took a film crew and we just filmed her story. And it's 15 minutes and we're actually going to be sharing it in the next couple of weeks on our website. But, you know, we filmed because it gave us a new avenue for storytelling that we weren't mm -hmm. currently doing. Well, it didn't quite work in the format that we had it, but that was the iteration and we kept going. And then Jenny Smith, and Kay Walsh in the UK, they came in and all the stars aligned. And then we finally said, hey, we know what to do with this now. And that was these workshops. And now we're traveling yeah. all around the world. Still basically doing the same things that we did before, um, but just internationally and via video. That's awesome. It's great. And and the Cool Folk audience too. Like the Cool Folk audience that we built, like it's, it's this is an audience full of people who want to take risks too, who who trust Quilt Folk at this point. You know, the, the uh, Bronte sisters workshop, you know, the Bronte sisters made a quilt I was in England, Jenny Smith and Kay Walsh were there. And it was like, let's do an online workshop about the Bronte quilts. We went and we saw it at the Bronte Parsonage. I mean, it was a very unusual workshop, but people loved it and it was so much right. fun. And it, and it kind of led into patchwork and prose. I mean, this is a, uh, it's it's a fresh idea. And people at this point say, you know, quilt folk, like we trust you to come up with something good, even if it's off the, you know, even if it's uh, unconventional. Yeah. Right. Le Leslie, can I say something real quick to the, to the, the quilt folk followers out there. I know we sent an email. I, I hope, I hope Absolutely. some of our followers out there. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to say a sincere thank you for sticking with us through a lot of this stuff. And um, I'm not going to take a lot of time saying this. I could, but you've watched this uh, company grow and my family grow along the way. And I just really enjoy what we're doing. And also give a shout out to Mary. Really enjoy our friendship and our relationship um, and the ability to work together. And also a shout out to our team who some of them are watching. Um, and I just want to say that I am a firm believer that it really is the people in your organization that make make the whole thing work. Um, the creativity, the execution, the good vibes, the, the willingness to want to get up and go to work. All of that stuff is extraordinarily important. And we have all that stuff in place. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for taking this journey with us. Well, believe us, as, as those who have subscribed to the magazine it is a delight and to find it in our mailbox um, it's so gorgeous I have one quick question and then pretty soon we're going to have to close up and say our thank yous but um, <clears throat> quilts Native American quilt maker Susan Hudson is with us Mary you remember Susan was at our board meeting Mary Fonz is on our um, international advisory board of the museum and we had the pleasure to have um, Susan with us in May at our uh, board meeting, and um, she was asking if um, Quilt Folk is going to do an article on Indigenous quilters and telling their stories and histories. You know, the South Dakota issue, Brianna, the, Brianna Briggs, the fabulous managing editor of Quilt Folk, um, she does such a wonderful job. I've been showing pictures from the Rhode Island issue, which is the latest, um, but I mean, there are so many extraordinary stories uh, of indigenous quilt makers in the South Dakota issue. Um, I can pull up some images from that right now. Um, yeah, telling the story of the whole nation of quilt makers is so important. And, and Brianna, like I said, does a beautiful job. Let me grab a couple images. As yeah, we, we try not to, we try not to miss uh, you know to miss any of it. I think it's the goal. Yeah. Of course, it's hard. We only have right. even if it's 160 
plus pages. That's usually 15 or 16 feature stories per issue. So you can't tell it all, but uh, the team does a good job of balancing that out. Is there an info at or a general email at either Fiber Art Now or Quilt <laughs> Folk that the public could send an email if they have an idea just to get it banked yeah. and into your hands to deal with it in and when you are able? Um, <clears throat> One thousand percent. It's a it's a big part of how we pick stories, word of mouth. Okay. So you can email um, hello at quiltfolk.com any stories um and also by the way i still check every email that i get all the time i try to respond in a timely way mike at quiltfolk.com if we're doing something great i love to hear it if we're doing something that you don't agree with love to hear that too it all goes into the hopper of how we evaluate what we're doing so love to hear from anyone uh, at any time there too thank you it has come the time where we have to say goodbye but mary and michael thank you so much I wasn't sharing an hour with us. Oh no, sorry, I wasn't sharing my screen. So Susan, don't leave. Sorry, as we close out, I'll show you the pictures I've been scrolling through. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. so I wanted to say thank you to both of you so much for your time and your conversation. You know, I'm a huge admirer of both of yours, and um, I appreciate it. Those of you in the audience, next week's talk is going to be awesome. We're going to have Visions Museum. Um, and they will be talking with San Diego artists. Oh, so you're not gonna wanna miss that. And um, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. I also wanted to, again, thank our sponsors. Um, <laughs> we could not, Mary, do you wanna stop sharing your screen so we can um, thank our sponsors? Um, yep. Oh, love, love those images. All right, yes. So gorgeous. Um, we want to thank our sponsors who make everything possible for us. Um, we couldn't do it without them. We also couldn't do it without all of you. Um, many of our audience um, have been very generous in providing sponsorship um, and donations and support as well, and for tuning in every week. So thank you all so much. We thank appreciate you. you. Um, we look forward to seeing you again next week at Textile Talks. So Michael and Mary, thank you again. Lucy, thank you for all of your help. And sponsors, thank you for everything that you do. Enjoy Thanks, your day. Leslie. Bye.